in southeastern Siberia, near the crystalline waters of Lake Baikal, lies the Hamardaban mountain range. In the language of the local peoples, Hamar means nose or nut, and Daban means ridge or pass. The Hamardaban slopes are the wettest place in the Baikal area, with about 1,300 millimeters of rainfall a year. The range is 50 to 60 kilometers wide and about 350 kilometers long. This is an extraordinarily beautiful land, which is why Hamar Daban has several nature reserves. The local forests are predominantly coniferous and inhabited by bears, deer, elks, and wolves, while at higher altitudes we can find alpine meadows. Multiple lakes are scattered across the region. Many animals, plants, and insects are endemic to the area around Lake Baikal, meaning they can be found only here and nowhere else on the globe. I have already made a video about a mountaineering disaster in the Hamar Daban range. I'll leave a link in the description for those of you who haven't watched it yet. There were many legends associated with these mountains and some travelers are wary of the idea of hiking around here. The reason for this wariness is not only the unpredictable weather, but also the fact that Buryatia, the region where most of the Hamar Daban range is located, will seem very unfamiliar to anyone from the European part of Russia or Europe in general. The Republic of Buryatia has two official languages, Russian and Buryat. A very long time ago, in the 13th century, Buryatia was part of the Great Mongol Empire, but these places have been known to humans for much longer than that, with the first nomadic tribes appearing here before the Common Era. Nowadays, of course, modern civilization prevails in these parts, and the local inhabitants have internet and all the other boons of the Western world. Traditions and religion, however, continue to remind us of their ancestors. To this day, most Burats practice Buddhism. But let's get back to the mountain range. Among the peaks of Hamar Daban is the two-summited Bapha Mountain, which has been popular among mountaineers for quite a while. It is considered accessible for beginners, but even more experienced climbers will find the route enjoyable because of the lovely view. At the foot of the peak lies a pristine mountain lake and a beautiful meadow where one can make camp gazing at fields of ramson and mountain flowers all around. The first ascent here was made in the 1970s. Nowadays, Babha is considered so easy that even in the winter, hikers will climb it on skis. It's not that tall a mountain compared to the world's famous peaks, only 2,061 meters. The summit, however, offers a spectacular view of the famous Lake Baikal, the deepest lake on the planet. Baikal is also the largest freshwater lake on the continent. Unfortunately, it seems plausible that in several decades, climate change will turn this unique source of freshwater into a swamp. In recent years, Baikal has become overgrown with algae, typical of warm waters with no current. When climbing Babha, you will find a small monument. It's not too noticeable, but the story associated with it is both tragic and fascinating. It is a reminder of what happened at the peak in 1985. This disaster is not as well known as the incident with the Korovina group, which I have already talked about on this channel. But nonetheless, it serves as a reminder that even seemingly easy to climb mountains can be deadly. On May 3, 1985, Babha Mountain was the site of the May Touriade, a collective ascent. Many buses with hikers, instructors, and group leaders had arrived in the towns around Hamar Daban. The number of people was unprecedented. Realizing there were too many interested in the ascent, its leaders selected the most prepared members of their groups, allowing only them to go to the summit. The rest were asked to return home. However, 
Those who had come to participate in the ascent had already taken days off at work, made preparations and packed their backpacks for several weeks ahead. So no one wanted to turn back before even starting. As a result, those who had not been selected for the climb decided to organize their own illegal hike without instructors or leaders, out of sheer desire to climb the peak. Most of them didn't even manage to get into the buses that brought most of the Tourier participants to Homar de Bon, so they took the train. Here's how Galina Misharina, one of the participants, recalls it. At the end of April, our hiking club was preparing to take part in the regional hiking contest. There were many newcomers in the group, just like me, and we really wanted to get into this contest. Experienced campers helped us prepare. Our group was well equipped. In short, everyone was looking forward to the trip. However, on April 27th, we learned that we wouldn't be taking part in the event and decided to go hiking by ourselves. We went by electric train to Sladyanka. From there, we took a train to Utulik. And then we went on foot. Everything was going well. It was exciting. On the last day of the Touriade, Misharina and her mates set out for Babha a total of 19 illegal hikers. They left the camp at 10 in the morning. The weather was excellent. The temperature was about 10 degrees Celsius with a light wind and good visibility. There was a lot of snow, however, and every now and then the hikers would fall through it. They reached the peak at 1 p.m. The climbers were in a great mood. On the way up, they sang songs and upon reaching the summit, they treated themselves to candy and chocolates and took photographs extensively. Hira Misharina's recollections of that day. We stayed on the summit for about three hours. I don't know exactly. The weather was great. It was sunny but windy. We didn't drink anything, having with us neither thermoses nor flasks. We picked up the previous hiker's note from the jar. It was probably taken by Mihailov. He was also the one who wrote our note. Since we had no pencil or paper, we used a match to write the note on a chocolate wrapper. 19 parachutists have successfully landed on Babha Peak. The temperature is 12 degrees Celsius. The hiker's note has been picked up. We'll be flying further. It was windy and sunny. We went up from the side, kept falling through the snow on the summit. Leaving a note at the summit is a mountaineering tradition. You have to bring down the note left by the previous climbers and leave your own in a special jar. Finally, it was time to start the descent. Mihailov, who had written their note, went down first. For the way back, they didn't take the route of the ascent, apparently having decided to leave one more note in the pass. Just as on the way up, they fell knee-deep in the snow again and again. And as they descended, they noticed that there was even more soft snow. And then suddenly, one of the climbers, Alexander Yepin, shouted, Avalanche! The rushing mass knocked Galia Misharina off her feet, dragging her through the snow. She was closer to the end of the line, with about five more people behind her. Suddenly the snow sank, everything went topsy-turvy, my legs buckled, my eyes began to hurt as snow dust suddenly started swirling, making it hard to breathe. It swung me around, flung me against the rocks, I was flying through the air. All this happened in an instant. My head got stuck in a snowdrift, I wiggled my legs a bit and fell asleep. When Alexander cried his warning, it was already too late to do anything. That's how fast the avalanche came. All the members of the group had avalanche cords on them, balls of rope that are tied on the belt and can be thrown out in case of an avalanche. Such cords have markings and arrows indicating where to look for the person who threw it. But since everything happened so quickly, no one had time to use them. The avalanche came down with a thunder-like bang. Afterward, there was a deadly silence. Suddenly, Alexei Potapeko stirred in the snow. He survived, and regaining consciousness, began to descend in search of survivors. He saw that Gale was stuck upside down in the snow and hurried across to save her. He brought Gale to her senses, and the two of them continued their search. But they quickly realized that they were the only survivors. Misharina and Potapeko 
went back to the foot of the mountain and told the others what had happened. The search operation didn't begin until one day later. On May 5th, 150 of the most experienced local hikers and mountaineers were gathered and put to work on the avalanche. Those who had taken part in the ill-fated Touriade were also sent to the recovery site. They were lined up and told that all the men would participate in the rescue operation, no excuses. Here's how one of the rescuers remembers it. They started dropping us off at the site of the disaster. The helicopter hovered over a small clearing and we had to jump straight into the snow, down as quickly as possible. It's not that easy to get down there, the slope is steep and you have a backpack on you. Here are the tents of the mountaineers. We throw off our backpacks, have a sip of tea, put a shovel in our hands and head for the avalanche. There, the work is already in full swing. Everyone understood that surviving among the compacted spring snow would be akin to a miracle, but they believed in it nonetheless. People worked as hard as they could until there were bloody blisters on their hands. A faint hope flickered in the heart of every rescuer as he stuck the avalanche probe into the snow. What if I get lucky now and find someone? What if someone is still alive? It could have been me in their place. With each body we found, our hopes faded. Eight bodies were found quickly after a cursory surface probe. The probes didn't go deeper than three to five meters, so we had to dig exploratory holes. Being in a grave-like ditch was frightening, especially when you think of all the slopes that still haven't avalanched. These are the recollections of Luda Zabrowskis, the rescuer who headed the operation. One by one, the rescuers found the bodies. It was clear from the way they were discovered that most of the group died instantly, without even having the time to brace, becoming frozen in place forever. To survive in an avalanche, you need to create an air pocket near your mouth. It can be done with your hands, for instance, but the climbers didn't have a chance to do even that. The avalanche crushed their chests, killing them in a matter of seconds. Before transportation, the bodies were left to thaw in the sun for a while, and rescuers recalled that the bodies kept moving. Most were young women, their faces pink, looking as if they were asleep. The wind played with their disheveled pigtails and ribbons. Once thawed, the bodies began to move under their own weight. One guy's torso slowly bent and sat up. The women lowered their raised arms and lay down. It was a terrifying sight. One impressionable rescuer nearly got a heart attack from what he saw, recalls one of the rescuers. This frightened man was the first person they actually had to rescue. They sent the impressionable climber back down while the other rescuers decided to handle the difficult side by the tried and true method. Luckily, they had brought enough vodka. They drank it without toasting, sat around the fire and started telling stories to each other in order to come to their senses. The search operation continued for about two weeks. During all this time, all the rescuers found were the bodies of the deceased. A helicopter was used during the search, which was a strange decision, since its low frequency vibrations could have triggered an avalanche. Fortunately, the rescuers quickly realized this risk, and the helicopter began flying at a safe distance. Could the disaster have been prevented? Perhaps it would not have happened if the hikers had not decided to go alone, without their leaders and instructors. According to Galina Misharina, there were no avalanche instructors with them, neither during the ascent nor on their way back. The untrained group went to the mountain at their own risk, overestimating their strength and simply hoping that nothing bad would happen. On June 13, 1985, the newspaper Soviet Youth published an essay in which its author tried to figure out what really happened on the snowy slope. In his opinion, there were several reasons for the tragedy. Firstly, the hikers didn't go along the crest of the slope, 
but tracked just below it, meaning their steps would have undermined large masses of snow. But Apeiko managed to hide behind a rock, which saved him, while Gala Misharina survived by a mere stroke of luck. Secondly, the group from the Irkutsk Pedagogical Institute hadn't filled out the correct documentation to participate in the track, which turned them into savages of a sort, unregistered and unmonitored. The fact that they weren't allowed to participate in the official hike also played its role. They went into the mountains alone despite everybody else. Thirdly, during the hike, they kept the wrong distance, breaking even basic principles of climbing safety. And as it has turned out, this not particularly prepared group climbed the slopes of Hamar Daban in the most dangerous season, late spring, even though the Central Tourism Board had prohibited visiting the ridge till May 25th. It was probably the chaos that reigned on the mountain slopes those days that was to blame for such an awful tragedy in which 17 young men and women lost their lives so senselessly. What do you think played the most important role in the tragedy? Write your thoughts in the comments. And if you're interested in other such stories, subscribe to my channel and send your friends the link to this video. Let me know if there are any other stories you think I should cover here. Thanks for watching. Stay safe.